My relationship with the night. Um, well, I wouldn't say I'm a night owl, but um, I've always loved the change from day to night and the way people, I guess, the duality of our lives. Um, you know, some of us um, come home alone and some of us come home to family. And um, some of us like the moon, some of us like the stars, some of us like drinking, some of us don't. And I guess that some of those things, in terms of themes, were the things we wanted to explore. But also, I wanted to make, I guess, a, a strong visual poem of the world at night because photography is quite different in the daytime and the world's quite different. And um, the beauty of the night can be captured in something like this. Uh, so they were kind of, you know, some of the main motivations, really. But I guess when we're doing the interviews, um, we're always looking for something emotional for people to talk about, uh, not in terms of their heart on their sleeve, but just simple anecdotes about how they felt about the world at night and things changing uh, in their lives generally, as, as is evidenced in the, in the film. Everything's better at night. <laughs> well, Almost. it's interesting seeing the film in this theatre because the sound is uh, quite amazing, really, and, um, and the projection, because I haven't seen this film for a while and um, usually you see it on DVD on a small screen or lots of people now watch films on computers, which, you know, is the modern technology. But when you plan a film like this, uh, you know, it's an awful lot of work and to go to all those locations and most of the film was shot um, on 35mm and Super 16, apart from the digital interviews. So uh, in some senses, it's uh, it's an old fashioned film in by today's regard, because uh, you're watching a di what's called a DCP tonight. Um, so I haven't been in Australia for a long, long time. I did recognise Sydney and I think there was Melbourne. Where else did you shoot? Uh, well, we, <coughs> you have many states here. We have six. Uh, we have a lot of land, but um, uh, we, we, we covered basically five states, um, city and rural. Uh, we only had a certain amount of budget, so really we were only allowed to travel a certain amount of places, obviously. Um, and uh, you know, I think we did a pretty good job in trying trying to give an overview visually of 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 an experience of night. Um, it was our hope, I guess, that wherever you lived in the world, that the iconography in the film you would relate to in some way, um, or even just sit back and listen to the music and and, and some of the landscapes and, and cityscapes. But I was also I kind of like um, some of the things like faces in the film, where we observe people um, unbeknownst to them. And some people might think that that's um, you know, not the right thing to do, but we would never have had, I guess, the sense of humanity, I think, and, um, and just simple emotion that crosses people's faces when they're being, un they're, un they're not, they're not uh, sort of realising they're being photographed. Yeah. How much, um, what portion did you shoot and what portion was um, stock footage? Uh, there's probably about maybe 15, 10 or 15 stock footage shots in the film. Everything else was photographed um, all by Laurie McInnes, the cinematographer and her camera assistant, and uh, it was all shot under available light. So everything that's lit in the film is obviously lit because it's a street or a room or whatever. Uh, so we, we, there were no setups throughout the film. Cool, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, did, did the narrative push this or the visuals push it? Did you get the narratives first and then you would shoot it? Also, yeah. how long did it take to uh, it took it took um, <clears throat> probably over a year to shoot on and off because obviously you don't you couldn't start and keep going because a budget wouldn't be able to afford that. Um, obviously, to finance the film, we had to there had to be a, a document. So I wrote a treatment and it was based on themes um, from simple things like the moon and the stars. But there are other things like coming home, um, fear of the dark, fear on the street. Um, obviously, some people talk about the fear between difference between men and women in the world on the street. Um, the way people dress. So it was very, it was a very wide open book in terms of subject. And so we did about th two weeks of interviews in Sydney and Melbourne with different people. And that was in the middle of our shooting. So it was a cross sort of current um, process and things we would find visually, we might, you know, obviously um, think that we can incorporate into an interview to comment about. <clears throat> and there are other things that were visual, like the performance of the Adelaide Arts Festival where the women, the goddesses are in the sky. That was something that obviously we didn't know about when we were planning the film and we were looking at sort of outdoor night events that were happening and then we went there and we um you know did a recce the day before because we could have turned up and it could have been really terrible and boring and not worth filming but it was quite beautiful and uh and obviously it, it's ended up in the film Yeah, um, the direct, the composer's name is Cesare Skubashevsky. Just uh, he always jokes that uh, award shows always nominate him, but he never wins. And he played his daughter, who's an actress, um, an awards tape, 
and nobody could pronounce his name. And uh, so she's since changed her name as an actress now. And uh, she's actually been, we're doing work in Spartacus, the TV show and stuff. But he's a great composer. And uh, we, from the start, wanted to have a large symphonic score. And uh, so Cesare really had carte blanche to basically score as we were working. And again, it was a concurrent um, process. Uh, he had done music for two of my previous films. And I, we talked about certain styles of music. Like there's obviously a really beautiful jazz track in the middle of the film, um, under the cityscape. Um, there's sort of a dirty guitar under the work section. Then there's far more romantic and soft pieces throughout uh, the film. And then there's also more sort of dark edge, sort of, I wouldn't say thriller, but you know, stuff that, that connotes the genre of thriller or, or um, mystery and suspense. Yeah. But um, he uh, recorded a lot of the score in Poland and um, the rest of it was done in Australia and I didn't go to Poland when it was being recorded, but I'd heard obviously the temp tracks. And, um, but I did go to some sessions with some singers in Melbourne, which was really a very special thing to observe. Mm. Anyone else? How did you choose your interview subjects? Well, some, are, some were people I knew that I thought would be interesting. Like there's a guy called Bill Henson, who's a, a photographer, who's done a lot of night uh, photography, but I didn't want to interview him about his work because obviously it's not an arts documentary, but I wanted to talk to him about how he felt about the night in different ways. You know, there's a sleep doctor in there that I kind of like basically found like through the telephone book. Um, we put out some calls through the internet and got some people like the woman that tells a story about the murder. And, you know, it was, they, they came from a range of places, really. Yeah. And a couple of people were people I knew. Um, and there's a writer who's in it. Um, he's the man that speaks about his uh, mother not wanting to throw the breadcrumbs out um, into the darkness for fear, fear of spirits coming to the house. Yeah. Up there. Hi there. Um, your film is beautiful. Um, Thank you. The segment with the fireworks, uh, was that during Valentine's Day in Australia? Oh, no, we have a tradition in Australia, like you would have here in, in various places, of New Year's Eve. And the biggest tradition of New Year's Eve in Australia is the Sydney Harbour fireworks. And that was the first sequence that we shot of the film. Um, and basically it's just huge in terms of the amount of people that gather around whether it's in boats or on the land and um you know there's an awful lot of security now because of the way things are um to keep that sort of special but it is a very big you know it is it is the the, the biggest event of the year really in sydney i think yeah and they always have a theme you know with the with the bridge and um and they always spend the most incredible amount of money on fireworks so it's kind of weird not to actually celebrate in some way in the film Thank you so much. Thank you. Was there something that you left out that you thought of later that didn't end up in the film? Or maybe you might be working on a part two or something? Uh, there will be no part two. I <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. um, uh, not really. Um, you know, we worked on a budget and, um, and I think that you assemble the material as much as you can. I mean, you could keep shooting and shooting and shooting um, forever. but. You know, I'm mindful, like the film runs for 85 minutes and, you know, some people could say the film could run for 60 minutes. Um, it really depends on whether you kind of get into it or not, I think, and, and whether it interests you. But most, you know, mostly we've had really good positive response about it and I think people appreciate the form of the film, that it's not traditional. Um, and as I said, when I, at the start, it's not like a reality doc. You know, every frame of the film was worked on in terms of making it... Um, visually beautiful and how it would actually fit into the scheme of the film and then I also you know one thing with the editing is sometimes it's kind of abstract and I quite like that as well that you know you are involved with the film and you're not necessarily seeing all the time what you're hearing about you're seeing a lot of other images and and play of light that plays on you especially when you see it in a cinema kind of reminded me of Kuana uh, Squatsi well, it, you couldn't make a film like this without having done research into um, Godfrey Reggio's, he did a trio of films, Kona Squatsi, Power Squatsi and Naka Squatsi. And um, this is obviously follows in that tradition of music image films. But one thing I learned about reading his interviews that he did was he, um, he had researched a lot of archival films about social life on the streets of America. And um, his film is an incredibly powerful film, the first film. And I got to look at Helen Levitt's film In the Street, which was made in the 40s, just observing children playing in the street. So, and other things that he did of, of people crossing streets and all kinds of um, US government films that were produced here. And, uh, and those, those films influenced me in just in a nod to, in, throughout my film as well. And I'm sure there will be other films that are about observance of life as his was and mine was and had preceded his as well. Yeah. Um, so what are you working on next? 
Well, um, there are two people in the audience at the moment I'd like to acknowledge, and that's Donna Anderson and Karen Kramer, because um, I came here a couple of years ago and I did an interview with them, and I just finished a film. It's called Fallout. It's very different to this one. It's very story-driven, and it's essentially about a British novelist called Neville Shute, who wrote an end of the novel, uh, end of the world novel on the beach, and um, he wrote that because uh, it was a, I guess, uh, a warning to the world following the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But uh, what Stanley Kramer did, the director and producer, he went to Australia and he made a film adaptation with Gregory Peck and Ava Gardner. And uh, so the film follows Neville Shute's life because he flew his own plane and lived in Australia. He wrote his last novels there, he was quite famous. And so the film centres on On the Beach, um, which has an amazing concept because it's about radiation and the end of the world. And it tells the story of the lives and loves of these people in the last city left on Earth. But also it has a Hollywood fanzine aspect to it and uh, filmmaking aspect to it in that it explores Stanley's film and Karen and Donna both were part of that and um, they, they they figure in the film and the film will be finished probably in about a couple of weeks so we'll be out for festivals um, in this year. Thank you, Karen. I thought you might have. I thought Karen might have seen it and thought, "Oh my God, it's really abstract. What is he going to do with it?" <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, the gentleman behind you, I think, oh, had his hand up first. I was, I was interested in the. You had that song. The really, I think it was the one song in the film. Everything was changed. Yeah. Yes. Great song. Yes. Yes. I just suppose that over the uh, over the church sequence, and I, I just wondered what the thinking was there. It was fascinating. Well, everything does change, <laughs> and it's such a beautiful song. Um, I guess, you know, there was a, when you make a film like this, you show it to people at certain points when you're cutting it, and then people go, what about this, and what about that, and blah, blah, blah. And we always want to explore religion, but of course we couldn't be in every church of the land of every denomination. So there is a, obviously a leaning toward a Catholic church and a Greek church within that sequence. But I guess when we saw some of the footage that uh, Laurie had found, particularly of people with candles, you know, we, um, particularly in the Greek church, and there's lovely facial shots and children and things. Um, I was listening to music and talked to Cesare about another, yet another piece of music, and I was like, well, we could have another piece of music, but why don't we think about a song? And um, and I love that song, and we just cut it together in a rough way and had a look at it, and, and then it ended up in the film. Is that Nina Simone? Yeah. The Lady in Red? Did you just um, sit in for most of the editing ses uh, sessions or did you just let the person go and edit and then <laughs> 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 Annette Davies in the audience here and she cut one of my earlier films called Eternity. Um, and uh, I think the I think the best directors, you know, are there for a lot of the film. But you know, editors have to um, it's a collaboration. You know, you can't just cut the film, you might as well just cut the film yourself. So really you um, you're there for a lot because, you know, when you give people material, it's shot and it just comes through and they're obviously looking at it and assembling it, but they don't have all the knowledge that you have and that you've accumulated. And they bring their own work and knowledge to what they what you give them. So it has to be a two-way street, really, um, I think, yeah. The reason I was asking is um, I don't have any money, so I'm actually the director and the editor. And um, some people have told me you should really let editor do it because they have a different vision and that I'm too close to the subject. I would say that would be good, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to have a, a very long film and uh, you're going to love everything of it, in it. And sometimes it's not good to love everything. I mean, even the attorney film that Annette cut, um, Dion Beebe, who photographed that, who now lives here, and he won an Oscar for Memoirs of a Geisha and had great success in his work. He were, saw a cut of the edit Eternity film and I was so beholden to the structure of it and he gave me a key which I've always remembered and it was about emotion. It wasn't necessarily about reality and it wasn't necessarily about time. It's about how people are feeling as they're watching the film and what people are saying as the film is progressing. And, you know, people might go, well, that didn't happen then, or blah, blah, blah. And as long as you're not kind of crossing the line or ruining it in reality, you know, I think emotion is a very strong part of, of, of good work. Yeah. Okay, we kind of have to wrap it up now. Um, thank you very, very much. And thank you, everyone, for thank coming. Thank you. Thanks for coming.
Just a couple more things. Uh, every month, Film Festival Flix opens here in the Los Angeles area and then exclusively travels to select cities across the country. The films are available on demand on filmfestivalflix.com. If you like the films, please spread the, help spread the word and tell your friends to join us each month. Uh, please join us at Big Wang's. Again, uh, follow the crowd. <laughs> Uh, turn right and then um, walk down the street and uh, join us for some appetizers and stuff. Thank you. And if you were one of the two people that won the badges, if I could see you up front for a minute, that'd be great. <laughs>